Good evening. I am Dr. Sarah Federka, and I am the chair of the departments of English, Philosophy, and Religious Studies at the University of Findlay. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event. The Freed Contemporary Christian Lecture Series is made possible through a generous gift of the late Dr. DeBow and Kitty Freed. Dr. Freed was president of the university from 2003 to 2010. The Freeds valued the humanities to the extent that they endowed a gift that allows us to bring to campus each year a renowned speaker who epitomizes a Christian-centered ethos. The Freed lecture speakers demonstrate respect for multiple faith traditions, they practice civil expression, excellence of thought, humility, compassion, and service. Tonight's speaker, Ms. Barbara Mahaney, exemplifies all of those traits. Ms. Mahaney is an award-winning author, essayist, and longtime journalist. She worked for nearly 30 years as a staff writer at the Chicago Tribune. Prior to becoming a newspaper writer, Ms. Mahaney was a pediatric oncologist, and she worked at Chicago's Children's Memorial Hospital. In both of those careers, Ms. Mahaney was well served by her tremendous gifts of listening and observing. She is the author of five books, the most recent of which is The Book of Nature. Ms. Mahaney's talk tonight, Reading the Book of Nature, Are We Missing the Whole and the Holy of God's First Sacred Text, is an invitation. It invites us to look again at the ordinary and every day, to reattune ourselves to that which surrounds us. In doing so, Ms. Mahaney gently urges that we will chance to encounter the divine. The poet Emily Dickinson famously begins a poem with the line, I dwell in possibilities. Barbara Mahaney likewise invites us to dwell in possibility, the possibility that the sacred exists within the profane. And as she says in her book, that in that stillness, in the call to attention, we might just be saved. Before I invite Ms. Mahaney to come out to speak tonight, just a couple of housekeeping items. She will speak for about 35 minutes and after that, she has kindly offered to have a question and answer session with us. As you perhaps saw when you came in, her books are for sale in the lobby afterwards. And um, I am just so very thankful that you are here this evening. So now, if you will please join me in warmly welcoming Barbara Mahaney to our stage. And thank you all for being here. It is such an honor, it's such a, such a joy, such a pinch me kind of moment that I'm finally here. Um, wonderful, wonderful Sarah sent me an email months ago, months ago, and I just found out her adorable mother, who reads Richard Rohr every morning, is pretty much the reason I'm here. So thank you to Sarah's mother, um, Richard Rohr, the great, great, Franciscan mystic teacher um, who sends a newsletter out to two million people every morning, quoted from my little book. And I woke up one morning, and there's Richard Rohr, and there's my name. And people from all over were um, reaching out to me. And nothing more exciting than Sarah saying, and I said, how did you hear about me? And she said, Richard Rohr. And I was like, that was just this morning. So Sarah just jumps right on it. Anyway. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm honored to be here. Um, this Freed Lecture and everything it stands for. My brother told me this afternoon um, that he, um, his wife used to work for the Toledo Symphony. And he said he met Dr. Freed once upon a time at an event, at a symphony event. And he said, Dr. Freed is everything you want a college president to be, like in your imagination, like stepping out from central casting. So. 
Um, I'm so honored to be doing this for, I understand it was Kitty. She went by Kitty, Kitty and Debo Freed. This is for them and thank you all for being here. Um, one tiny, tiny bit of not housekeeping, but a, a little peek behind the curtain. Um, I just want you to know I had lung surgery a few months ago and when I woke up from surgery, my vocal cord, one of my two vocal cords was paralyzed. So I come to you tonight with half a voice, but a very full heart. And if my voice cracks or whatever, they've got me supplied with bottles of water and hot lemon tea, and we'll make it through. And I made sure to get really pretty pictures. So if my voice wobbles, you can watch the pictures. Here we go. Need my slide projector. In a lifetime punctuated by more than the occasional episode of undiluted mystification, another name for pure puzzlement, I remember well one not so long ago spell when I was hounded by what seemed a black hole in my religious upbringing. And I couldn't stop thinking, how did I not know? How do so many of us not know? How could it be that I'd never heard of the book of nature? I was a kid, after all, who'd grown up sloshing in a gurgly creek, chasing crawdads out from under rocks, giggling when the tough kids squealed the spindly wrigglers I daringly dangled from the end of my stick. A kid who'd spent her summer days make-believing her log cabin in a grove of shrubby backyard brush was a little house on the prairie, and whiled away her winter afternoons plopped on a frozen log on the woods across the way. But not only that, I was a kid who went to sleep at night, sure that God was gazing down on me, which explains why I tried so hard to fall asleep in the most angelic pose I could muster. Flat on my back, I swear to God I tried this every night, flat on my back, legs stiff and straight as a tiny tin soldier, bed covered smoothed of all wrinkles, tucked pertly under my chin, little hands clasped in prayer, pointing straight up toward the heavens, beatific glow, or so I imagined, spread across my rosy, freckled visage, my little lips upturned in my best approximation of the heavenly smile I'd plucked from my picture prayer book. So how could it be that I'd missed that one tome, the first sacred text that God had ever written? And why was it that a rabbi was the one pointing me to it? Like all tales worth telling, this one begins in the unlikeliest of ways. There I was, a half hour deep into a radio talk show, impishly titled, How to Be a Holy Rascal, hosted by a rabbi whose poetry and prayers happened to fill our synagogue's prayer book and often made my knees go limp in that way that a poet's words so often do. The good rabbi and I were talking about my very first book, Slowing Time, Seeing the Sacred Outside Your Kitchen Door, a collection of prayerful essays and a hodgepodge of wonderments that unfurls season by season. The rabbi was peppering me with probing questions when all of a sudden he piped in, slowing time reads like Midrash to the book of nature. He had me at Midrash, a Hebrew word meaning ancient rabbinic commentary, the practice of bringing sacred imagination to a scriptural text. It's not every day that a lifelong Irish Catholic slash Anglo Catholic has terms like midrash tossed her way, and certainly not in a way that pins her to the practice. But if midrash got my attention, it was book of nature that stopped me. Was there an actual thing? A book filled with pages of nature's wonderments? And if so, why would anyone, be they rabbi or scholar or priest, be offering up commentary. How had I missed it? This book that I sensed was not your everyday field guide, but something so awe-infused 
It comes with capital letters. Capital B, book of, capital N, nature. I set out to find out, beginning where many a quest, or every quest for knowledge, begins these days. I googled it. <laughs> Lo and behold, there exists such a so titled tome. Though it's metaphorical in name, it's an idea, a theological construct, a spiritual insight, long ago likened to a book, though it's not a real book at all, and its roots are as Christian as anything. It's ancient. It goes back, long before it was named, to preliterate civilizations, to eras and epochs and dynasties and tribes, before pages were printed, long before script. It goes back as an idea to the first human stirrings on the planet, when the first someone looked to the sky and felt some epiphany or suffered the blows of a harvest gone when some ancient scourge drowned or devoured or way overbaked it. Ancient peoples read the book of nature as the first sacred text, the text of all creation, inscribed and unfurled by a God present always and everywhere. Turns out, the ancients weren't the last ones to read it, though it wasn't so titled till millennia later. In a nutshell, this ancient theology held that through intent watchkeeping on nature, clearly God's handiwork, humankind might glean the workings of the one who'd sculpted the mountains and parted the seas and come to a deeper knowledge therein. Put simply, God had infused the natural world with symbol and meaning. And if only we read what's there in the trees and the storms and the stars and the hives, we might more fully comprehend the creator. Not unlike pondering a parable, unpuzzling a proverb. Or maybe this is the way to put it. From the beginning, God wanted to be in relationship with us, in duet with us, to reach out and touch us, to enfold us, to delight and enlighten us, and sometimes to shake us from our stupors. So God created the world, and God created us. And the ancients, and every last one of us since, we've all been plopped upon this planet not only to revel in God and God's creation, but to get close to to comprehend and apprehend in ways tactile as well as soulful and sensorial, all the wisdoms and wonder and godliness splayed across the heavens and earth. God wrote the book of nature, I've come to believe, so we'd revel in every page and paragraph, so we'd read what unfurls in the exuberance of springtime's blossoming, in the lightning that cleaves the sky, in the susurrations of a soft summer's rain. Let's hone in on the word read here for a minute. I don't mean read in the way we usually think of it, eyes scanning across sentences, brain absorbing what's spelled out on the page. Read, when talking about the book of nature, is something akin to spiritual practice. It involves plopping yourself out in the wilds and paying attention, looking closely to see what strikes you, what stirs you, wondering what wisdoms you might gather watching birds and bumblebees, scuttling clouds or caterpillars at work, at play, in wonder. Or maybe you're not looking too closely at all, yet suddenly you're swept into surprise into holy mystery, and you're left agasp, heart pounding, certain you've just been touched by something bigger, grander, indescribable, something I, and maybe you, call God. The metaphor of a book, of all this creation and all its wisdoms and wonder being pressed onto pages 
and bound to his spine, was seized upon by early Christian theologians and philosophers, new to and entranced by the notion that an ink and paper volume could contain what had been passed along only through oral tradition. A book in the early and middle ages was the repository for one's most cherished truths and treasures. And so the metaphor is apt, so very, very apt. For it points us to the truth that volumes of holy wisdom are unfurled for us day in and day out, in the very woods and water's edge, at the dawn and dusk, and in all the celestial shiftings, as near to us as the other side of our own back doors. It's a metaphor that drew me right in, allowed me to see that the very world in which we dwell is not just upholstery for our everyday, but is as if a godly kaleidoscope, one we're enwrapped in, one ever turned by the divine, as if each daybreak and nightfall is invitation into a deeper and deeper knowing of the one who breathed the first breath. It's ever been, and it's a book open to all. Through the ages, tracing through centers of knowledge and wisdom, east and west and across every continent, right up to the now, the book of nature has been the one sacred text that needs no translation. It's unfurled without words, composed in an alphabet of seashell and moonbeam, the flight of the birds and the plundering of nests. Its readers are prophets and poets, mystics and monastics, Christians and Jews, Buddhists and Muslims, Lakota and Anishinaabe, and those who'd not set foot in any house of worship. My first inklings of the Book of Nature came to me through Judaism, and not just because a rabbi was the first to utter the words in my presence. No, I married a blessed Jewish man. And as a lifelong devout Catholic who was wedding my life to that of an observant Jew, I dove right in to every myriad and facet of this religion that had ever fascinated me. It wasn't long till I was washed over by Judaism's intertwining of creation and the ever-present hand of God. Jewish prayers are punctuated with celestial reference, morning star and new moon, or the earthly, the flocks and the fields, the birds of the air, the lily among the thorns. Even the mitzvot, or commands, bow to creation. At the Harvest Festival of Sukkot, which is coming soon, you're to leave open the roof of your sukkah, or a makeshift shelter, so you can count the stars in the heaven. God commands us to see the stars. God wants us to live in wonder. On Shabbat, you're to light the Sabbath candles 18 minutes before the western horizon swallows the sun. And according to Jewish law, Shabbat doesn't draw to a close, I love this, until three medium-sized stars appear in the inky twilight of Saturday's dusk. Can you just see all the little Jewish ladies looking out their windows to see if it's time to stop yet? Again and again, Judaism points to the elements of creation, weaves them into the very fiber of liturgy and prayer, Again and again, there's a twinning of, of creator and creation, as if all the heavens are touch points to God and the godly. And so, when I came to the book of nature, to the idea rooted in the book of nature, I was stirred not only by my Catholicism's sense of a deeply intimate God, but also by Judaism's finer-grained reading of the cosmos, I found myself immersed in a newly palpable presence, a trace of the sacred etched through all creation. I was bumping up against a text of wonder and awe, authored by the God I'd always known, but never so perceptibly in every turning of this holy earth. So let me tell you a little bit about this book that I believe God wants us not simply to skim, 
to toss a glance as we dash here or there, but to read, to engage with, to extract wisdom and lessons and epiphanies, or sometimes simply to fall into it deep into its folds, to allow ourselves to encounter holy God in ways that make us know we've been brushed by the divine. Reading the book of nature is a sacred practice not unlike Lectio Divina, that monastic practice of scriptural reading and contemplation that dates back to the sixth century, a way of praying, praying that seeks the meaning of God's word hidden from most. It's a sacred practice not unlike the Torah study of Jews, rabbis and congregants alike, who for millennia have poured over the Hebrew Bible, parsing a single line, debating the meaning or translation of a single word. It's a spiritual practice of reading sacred text as old as time, and it demands the same attention, devotion, and deep diving into as the reading of all the world's holiest texts. One of the first bibliographers <clears throat> to put a name to the Book of Nature was Antony the Great, a third century Egyptian desert father, that is, those early Christian hermits and aesthetics who fled what they deemed pagan cities and persecutions by the Roman Empire and sought solitary lives in the Sahara. When Antony was asked by a curious visitor how he managed to be so learned with nary a book on a shelf, he replied, my book is the, book of nat uh, my book is the nature of created things, and as often as I have a mind to read the words of God, it is at my hand. Theophan the recluse, the 19th century Russian Orthodox saint, declared creation, quote, a holy book with uncountable and wonderfully different paragraphs. In the same century, but a different landscape, Henry David Thoreau is said to have walked his sanctum sanctorum, a grove of ancient oaks, alert to the mystical, quote, more as supplicant than naturalist. There's a way to walk in the woods as a supplicant. In his journal on September 7th, 1851, he wrote, if by watching all day and all night, I may detect some trace of the ineffable, then will it not be worth the while to watch? His life's work, as he saw it, was, quote, to be always on the alert to find God in nature, to know his lurking places, to attend all the oratorios, the operas in nature. I, too, am on lookout, and we needn't look too far. Let me read a passage from the first chapter of my own book titled, Yes, the Book of Nature. Mine is a quotidian geography. The undulations of my topography are of the humdrum variety. No sharp chiseled summits, no crags in the rocks. I live in the heartland, after all. A landscape long ago steamrolled into equanimity by Ice Age glaciers that erased most every speck of drama as they receded. Nowadays, the nearest flowing current to my old shingled house is a canal carved out of the prairie, one charged with curbing the flow of dreck into the lake. My lake is the Great Lake Michigan, forgive me. The one neighborhood landmark worthy of capital letters the one whose roar I can pick out if I train my ears keenly amid the howlings of incoming wind or winter storm. The woods I call my own are habitat to the homeliest of flocks, ones most often cloaked in iterations of drab. Chickadee, nuthatch, sparrow, siskin. We startle to any dab of color. Blue jay? Red-headed flicker, the perennial cardinal. Word travels fast if the barn owls swoop in. Sightings spread with ferocity. We are a people of dialed down expectations. <laughs> and yet, I am attuned and on high alert to the filigree and bedazzlement 
of the author of it all, the one who paints the dawn in tourmaline streaks and salts the night sky in chalky, sometimes brilliant flecks, the one who thought to quench the thirst of migrating butterflies with mists of fog and remembered that baby birds might do well to memorize the star-stitched tracings far, far above the nursery that is the nest. Mine is the god of sunrise and nightfall, the breath behind birdsong and breeze in the oaks. Mine is the god of a thousand voices, a thousand lights and gazillions of colors. Whether I notice or not, Mine is the God who never hits pause when it comes to creation. Inventing, reinventing, tweaking, editing, starting from scratch all over again, day after day after heavenly day. Turns out I'm but a speck among the many who in a centuries long timeline sense God in every pulse beat of creation. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the French Jesuit paleontologist and philosopher, in the opening passages of the Divine Milieu, his 1957 text for the waverers, those caught at faith's threshold, not in or not out, wrote this. By means of all created things, without exception, the divine assails us, penetrates us, and molds us. His words, apt for the atomic age, are apt for this moment, the digital age, as well. We imagine creation as distant and inaccessible, Teilhard argued back then, as the threat of nuclear ash still hung in the air. Whereas, in fact, he wrote, we live steeped in its burning layers. The world, this palpable world, which we are wont to treat with boredom and disrespect, is in truth a holy place, and we do not know it. In the mid-20th century, when Hiroshima and the Holocaust shrouded the planet in apocalyptic vision, draping the beautiful and the blessed under light-blocking cloth, Teilhard's words, in the way of all prophets, shattered a somnolence. Today, from our moment in history, his words echo that same prophetic awakening, this palpable world, which we are wont to treat with boredom and disrespect, is in truth a holy place, and we do not know it. Ours now, can't really see that, but ours now is a world lit up in digital glare. We stare into our phones instead of the stars, glued to our screens instead of the world in all its real-time rumblings and respirations. We dwell in the virtual instead of the natural. We opt for the metaverse instead of the universe. The great forgetting, it's been called, and it's led us toward an, a cascading ecology of loss. Not only are we pummeling the earth and poisoning the heavens, We've succumbed to an anesthesia of the soul, a numbing that sighs us from the sacred. The losses I worry about aren't only the ones tabulated by climatologists, counted in species decline and extinctions, waters rising and ice caps melting. The losses I tally are just as profound yet outside the bounds of the measurable. Beauty, wonder, the wild, intimacy, knowing the world by the whirl of your fingertips, by the dew of the dawn under your toes. Most of all, there's a slipping away of a palpable sense of God in our midst. It needn't be. It shouldn't be. The book of nature, too long ignored now, is the text that awaits our attention that draws us back into close-coiled communion. Know it or not, seen or unseen, we need reminding that we dwell in the thick of the, quote, grand volume of God's utterance as the Celts, a people ever keen to the whisperings amid the sanctuary of earth and sea and sky, have long referred to it. 
Lauren Isley, the archaeologist, anthropologist, and naturalist, once wrote, ever since man first painted animals in the dark of caves, he has been responding to the holy, to the numinous, to the mystery of being and becoming, to what Goethe very aptly called, quote, the weird portentous. Something inexpressible was felt to lie behind nature. And it doesn't mean we need trek to the exotic to trip over the numinous. Holiness is just as likely lurking in the quotidian, in whatever patch of grass or weed you call your own. And besides, the star-knotted nightcloth is draped over all of our heads. So too the moon, the light that shines nightly in ever-shifting fractions, never the same twice in a row. Nor does any of this mean we should trek only to the woods and toss aside the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or whatever is our sacred text. Thomas Aquinas, the 13th century theologian, astutely seized on the imperative of reading side-by-side -side texts. Sacred writings are bound in two volumes, he wrote, that of creation and that of Holy Scripture. This paired volume thinking came to be known throughout the centuries as the two-book theology, which holds that the presence of God is best apprehended through the tandem reading of creation, God's original sacred text, alongside Holy Scripture. The two-book metaphor permeated Western Christianity to varying degrees at varying times. Elsewhere, the central idea of a sacred cosmos had never been lost. It had long been rooted in the East, infusing the teachings of each Egyptian desert elders, Taoist philosophers, Buddhists and masters and lamas, Hindu sadhus, Muslim Sufi poets, and Jewish Hasids. Indigenous peoples the world over, and certainly the First Nations dwellers on this continent, never abandoned the knowing that the terrestrial call, the whistling of wind, the eagle's cry, the burbling brook, the thrashing rapids, was in each and every syntax the voice of God. But amid all these teachings and our own Judeo-Christian perspective, there's a critical distinction that must be made. The embeddedness of the divine in all creation is emphatically not to be confused with pantheism's point that God equals nature, the sense that God is the wind and water, sunlight and cloud. Rather, the lens through which I'm seeing is panentheism, God in wind and water, not God as wind and water. Put another way, get rid of nature to the pantheist and you get rid of God. Get rid of nature to the panentheist, and you see God all the more clearly. It's the stirrings and rumblings in nature that reveal the trace of the divine, that point toward the inexpressible, the immeasurable. We stare into the stars to glimpse the unfathomable. It is the visible invisible, the tracing of the divine etched across the cosmos. This understanding of what John Keats called the poetry of earth inscribed in a holy book traces its earliest roots to ancient Israel and the biblical po poets and prophets. Agrarian peoples straining to eke sustenance from the desert and the delta, they saw all of the natural world from rainfall to mustard seed as, quote, where the truth of God is hidden. For people steeped in the trials of survival, wholly dependent on heaven and earth, it's not hard to imagine that they sought and found in the wheeling rhythms of natural phenomena and the hard scrabble early world labors of farming and herding and fishing, the analogies that pointed to divine wisdom. Creation-centered spirituality especially flourished in the Celtic tradition which reached deep into the mysticism of John the Evangelist, 
He who at the Last Supper leaned against the chest of Jesus and heard the heartbeat of God. The Celts embraced that hallowed image to inspire the practice of listening for the heartbeat of God in all creation. But those teachings nearly got waylaid not long after their dawning, and their principal disciple all but muzzled in dueling theologies and a power play of the early Christian church. This tale of just missed extinction played out in the fourth through seventh centuries is one I recount in my book. The short version boils down to this. Augustine's hierarchical Roman church all but quashed the Celtic teachings of the blessedness of creation, a perspective most poetically captured perhaps in their expression that narrow shafts of divine light pierced the veil that separates heaven from earth. Ecclesial politicking wasn't the sole force pushing the book of nature and its author, God, increasingly out of reach. Somewhere along the line, there seeped in the thinking that harnessing the wild equaled progress. The fiercer and faster we've barreled through the ages, industrial, machine, atomic, digital, the farther we've got, grown from the god of the unharnessed wild. It's time to turn back. If we can't sense that perceptible presence, if we don't think to walk in the woods in the search of the holy, if we don't look to the heavens for something deeper than the stars, if the unbridled joy of a fledgling's first flight doesn't strike us as unscripted sacred instruction, then we're all but skipping the first best text God ever gave us, which is why I'm so emphatically trying to read it. It's not meant to be an easy read, though paradoxically, you need only open your senses to be drawn in. Here's what makes it especially tricky. One of the surest threads binding together the pages of this first book is the old idea of Deus absconditus, the hidden God, which means we live in the very presence of that God in our hours of oblivion. It's an idea that draws from an ancient hadith or saying of the prophet Muhammad, I was a hidden treasure and I desired to be known. The elusiveness, the catch if you can of it, is what takes my breath away. This is not a God inclined to clang me on the head, but rather to lie and wait, crouching low within the mystery, furled as the tight-fisted spiral of the fiddlehead fern. Celtic scholar Christopher Bamford once captured the idea of this God of hide and seek thusly. Wind and water, sunlight and cloud, Dream and vision, bird and animal, thought and silence, ebb and flow like so many veils before the face of God. And as he so aptly, poetically put it, mountains, grasses, and trees become his gospels, clouds and animals his prophets. Indeed, these are the Gospels and the prophets to which I turn, whose stirrings stir me, whose lessons I imbibe. In the words of St. John of the Cross, God passes through the thicket of the world, and wherever his glance falls, he turns all things to beauty. And so, the beautiful, the majestic, the intimate, the sweeping and the, and the deeply sorrowful is pressed on to the pages of the Librum Naturae, the book of nature. I read it all, every alphabet letter, nearly every time it catches me upside the heart. To me, to feel the holy, to break out in goosebumps because the hand of God has just touched me or stirred me is to sense that this is a God ever nearby, a God who keeps holy watch, 
A God who knows what catches my breath, what heavies my heart. A God awaiting my notice, drawing me into the dance the, to whirl in the whole of creation. And we'd best pay attention, exquisite attention. The Japanese poet Basho reminds us to be on the lookout for a, quote, glimpse of the underglimmer. Annie Dillard, that patron saint of seeing, Pulitzer Prize-winning author of Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, cautioned that for all of this holy, that for all this profusion of holy exuberance, quote, we can only feel blindly at its hem. So we go on our spelunking way mindful of Ralph Waldo Emerson's blessed instruction that, quote, the invariable mark of wisdom is to see the miraculous in the common. A humble path we trod a hundred times a week, a plot you might mis mistake for a jumble of weeds, the most familiar nook or cranny just beyond your kitchen door. That might be the crosshairs where earth and heaven touch, interpenetrate, illuminate one another. And that, the barely perceptible but utterly certain present presence, might be the one holy thing that we seek, an ancient and abiding echo, the bottomless well of the sacred that rests in each of our souls, yearning to be awakened, enlivened, rustled from sleep. It's the God of the sunrise I seek, the God of the night hall, nightfall who lulls my soul into stillness and anoints all the hours between. But here's the urgency. The spine-stiffening truth is that as a people, we've abandoned our watch on this one holy earth, the losses are dire and mounting. It's not just the bulldozed meadows or the wildflowers no longer quenched by mountainside snows. Not just coral reefs bleached ghost-like in sauna-warm seas or the American goldfinch or the hooded warbler whose forests are incinerated and whose nests are washed out in torrential spring rains. It's not only these lamentations that stir me to weep. More than anything, it's the loss of the sacred. A quarter century ago, theologian Thomas Berry, in his call to attention, the great work wrote, we no longer read the book of nature. We have silenced too many of those wonderful voices of the universe that spoke to us of the grand mysteries of existence. All these years later, that silence teeters at the brink of requiem. The time is short, and it only grows shorter. This magnificent book of nature is ours to love. This book with its infinite lessons, its thousands embraces. If only we put down our distractions and behold it. If only we search for, entwine with its author the one stirring the wind, arcing the sun across sky. And if we don't, if we turn away from the God who wrote the whole of creation, who waits to bump up against us, to delight, to mystify, to astonish, to catch us mid-breath, deep in the shadowy woods or the still of the night, in the high notes of birdsong at dawn, or the forlorn echo of owls in the woods, if we cut ourselves off from this God of infinite and intimate encounter, how in the world will we ever join in the cosmic dance? Thank you. Okay, questions are promised, and me and my shaky voice here. A sip of tea from the college president, no less. 
you She's have the magic questions, tricks. I will walk around with the microphone. Okay. So how early in your life did you fall in love with nature as an emissary of God? That's such a great question. I fell in love with nature because I was raised by a woman we refer to as the original Mother Nature. Um, my mom um, was a nature girl her whole life, and I, I laugh. When my mom was, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, taking home movies with her little fancy new Kodak, whatever, a chrome camera, she would have her five little kitties in the backyard, and she would sort of be, you know, interested in taking, making movies of us. And then suddenly a scarlet tanager or an indigo bunting would flutter into the oak trees. And never mind the kids, she had the camera panned on the birds up in the arbors. So, um, and I grew up, I grew up with this creek across the way and these woods and we could roam until the dinner bell clanged and then we'd go back out again. So I don't, I, th I think the, the really pivotal thing is I knew, I, I knew I sensed God all around, because I was always kind of looking for God. <laughs> um, but it was, it, there was something precise that happened when I discovered this idea of the book of nature, that it was, that it was, you know, that this whole theological construct behind it, and it wasn't just happenstance that every once in a while I might feel something that gave me goosebumps, but to really understand it, and I think the point that I've come to appreciate even more in the months and years since I've been digging deep into the subject is this idea of reading it in, in, in a scriptural, you know, it's an engaged reading. Um, you know, as I said, Lexio Divina and Torah study, um, I'm kind of a, a, a crazy interfaith person and um, I do Torah, I've been doing Torah study for the last couple of years every Saturday morning with the rabbi and all the nice Jewish people in our congregation. I'm the only Catholic one sitting there, but I find it. And, and the engagement with text is, you know, it's, it's, you know every, every, every letter and syllable is teased out for its meaning. And that's a similar kind of engagement. You know, when you plop yourself in your backyard or your garden, it's to begin to ask the questions and you know, what can I glean from this? Thank you. And on and on. That's, that's beautiful. Thank you. Any other questions from this lively crowd? Thank you to all of you students who on a Friday night showed up. I'm thinking maybe you guys are from like a football team? Yes. And did your coach tell you that if you came here tonight, he would let you start tomorrow? <laughs> no, you just came from your own sort of. We won't push any farther, but it's lovely to see all of you. And I hope you win tomorrow just because you came tonight. Yeah, that's right. We'll talk, Are you to, playing we'll tomorrow? talk to coach. Are you playing tomorrow? Oh, well, who are you playing? Well, what? Hillsdale. Oh, Hill, Hillsdale in Michigan? Mm-hmm. Are you traveling? Tonight? You get up like really early in the morning? <laughs> How do you get there? It's an out to Michigan from here? Oh, I guess my geography's messed up. Well, good luck. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, Darcy. I think you're the theology professor, right? Oh, both of you, both of you, okay. Okay, here we go. When I heard there were religious studies professors here, I got nervous, I was like, oh man, I hope. Yeah. I hope they don't fact check me. No, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. This thank is you. wonderful. Thank you. Um, I had a question because I recently um, read a book called The Invention of Nature. About oh, yeah, I read it too. You read that? I think yeah, yeah, you yeah. probably did. Yeah, about Alexander Humboldt. Yes. 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 And so um, I was wondering, like, as far as nature as a text, 
Are we outside observers of that, or are we a part of that phenomenon? Because um, that, that book talks about um, you know, the invention, like a human invention of nature, but really Alexander Humboldt saw us all as you know, one big um, existence. So I, I, I guess two parts. Are we outside observers? And if we are, um, how does that affect things like climate change? Um, you know, things happening in the world like that. I'll answer the first part first. I think we're, dev we're absolutely part of all of nature. We're absolutely, like that's, that, that, that connectivity is, is, is the magnificence of it. You know, I can just go down rabbit holes forever, but you know, like when I, when you think of the medicines that are saving like our hearts and our cancers and our everything that come from the tropical rainforests. I mean, the whole point here and the urgency, the, re the urgency that propels the idea of this book for me is that we need to see that. We need to understand this divine kaleidoscopic connectivity and I need to save those wildflowers because those wildflowers might have, we know echinacea comes from coneflowers. Echinacea is what people take when they have infections and colds and all sorts of things. So we all need each other. Um, I very much work, but we have this capacity as humans. We have this capacity to also be observers students of, I think students of is more important coinage than observers because the whole idea is to engage. Um, and it's all there. Like I love to get, since I was a nurse before I was um, a writer, science, I love science. Where's my new friend, the dean of all the sciences? I know I saw him, there he is, there he is, there he is. Um, you know, like, when you, when you go down science rabbit holes and start to like, like that line that I read tonight, when I discovered that monarch butterflies who have the, lo the longest migration in the world, it's thousands and thousands of miles and they don't stop. They quench their thirst in the mists of fog that rise, they, they, they tend to fly along I'm blessed, I live by, you know, the great, um, the great flyway, the Lake Michigan, you know, the Great Lakes flyway. So, like, that's just amazing. And then when I found out that baby, you know, scientists, researchers, this isn't me making this up, discovered that baby birds memorize the constellation, the, not the constellations, but they memorize the positioning of the North Star and they know how to find their way. There are some species of birds, and I'm talking to a room that probably has plenty of animal science people who know way more than me about this, but there are, there are some you know, fledglings whose mama and papa bird take off on their migration and leave the little guys behind, and the little guy like, gets up one night and just finds his way. So when, like, the more I understand all of these kind of magnificent miracles, I just stand back and say, there, there has to be a God. They're just like, so many times proof, like just inexpressible proof just like strikes me like a thunderbolt in my um, paying close attention to nature. And um, this is a whole nother idea, but but this book is, became as much an exercise in reading as it was an exercise in writing. And I also find that my pathfinders are reading, like reading the book, The Invention of Nature, reading all these. That's why there's so, the, this book, I have a whole section in the back of the book called The Bookshelf of Wonder. And the bibliography is like 30 pages long because, um, these, these people who see so much and who have the knowledge to see so much more deeply than I could ever see with just my plain pedestrian eyes, um, they also draw me into the, uh, 
the indescribable sacred divine. So it's, it's a parallel thing. Like I'm reading the book of nature, but I'm also reading all kinds of other texts that point me to that deepening. Ashley, I was told to look for you today by one of your dear friends. I think it turned off. <laughs> Hold on, let me grab you the other one. If you say it, I'll repeat it. Yeah, are we good? Uh, oh, yeah. thank now you, it's Adam. Working. Now it's working. Yeah. Um, I was Adam wondering, Earth. you said that when you first heard that term, the book of nature, that it was something new to you, even with growing up in a church religious context. Why do you think that religious entities, especially the church, don't talk about it more? That's such an interesting question. I love that question. That's, I don't know the answer to that. I, I mean, I was just flip. How many people here, before you walked in this room, heard of the book of nature and the religious studies people, I don't know if we should let you be in on this or not. You've heard of the book of nature. I mean, the idea was alive to me, but I didn't know. So I don't know why. That's why I'm so emphatically trying to pull it out from the cobwebs because I think it's, especially now, I feel like this moment in in cultural history, in time, in which we've used words as cudgels and we divide ourselves into, you know, this sect and that sect and we're all balkanized. And the book of nature is wordless and it's open to everyone everywhere and clearly all these sacred wisdom traditions through all of time have been engaged with God I mean, when you think about it, you know, there were human beings on the planet <clears throat> for millennia before books were books. And all those people had a very alive sense of God. So where were those wisdoms coming from? And Antony the Great, or Antony, Antony, just Antony, you know, with nary a book on his shelf, you know, all created things, the hand of God, or God is at hand. Excuse me. We will please join me in saying thank you again to our speaker. Thank you, thank you to Sarah. Thank you. thank you so much for spending your Friday evening with us. Um, books are for sale in the lobby, and I invite you this weekend to find the miraculous in the everyday. So thank you, and safe travels home. Bless you. Thank you.